All right. Our final presenter of the day is, uh, I'm sure everyone here knows, James White from Legend Story Studios, uh, the creators of Flesh and Blood. How are you doing, James? I'm oh, very, very well, Mashi. Thank you very much. Um, this is an amazing opportunity. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your Saturday with us. An amazing opportunity. Um, Flesh and Blood, of course, just released Monarch. We're in between this cycle of first edition Monarch. We have unlimited Monarch coming out. But for anyone in the gaming space, for anyone in the collectible card gaming space, I know you've heard of Flesh and Blood. And sometimes it's, it's you know, the conversations I've had is I say, well, there's Flesh and Blood. And they say, what? What is that? I haven't heard of it. And then you start describing how popular the gameplay is. I always use Luis because a lot of my reference is Magic Plus. I'm like, well, I know Luis loves it. And then you start talking about what's being opened in terms of value-wise, the collectability of this game, the, the popularity and the fervor over getting into Flesh and Blood. So this is an, a unique opportunity for everyone here at LGSC2 um, to ask James questions about uh, LSS, about Flesh and Blood. There's, you know, like I said, there, we're in between um, we're kind of in between set releases. It's the same set. We have the first edition of Monarch just came out. Unlimited Monarch is due out in a few weeks. There's this mega huge OP announcement that uh, LSS just made uh, on Friday. So tons of of um, stuff going on for LSS. I'll start us off. There's there's uh, a few questions here that I think are really really uh, interest interesting. Um, have you heard of any more niche formats for Flesh and Blood? Players have created their own deck building rules or other challenges. I know. One of the things about Flesh and Blood um, is players are getting their hands on their cards and they're playing it and, you know, just having a great time with it. We have Blitz, we have, you know, Standard. So um, any other crazy formats you've heard of? Mm. So just firstly, um, uh, good afternoon, America. Good evening, uh, Europe. And good morning, uh, Asia Pacific retailers joining us today. And I just want to say thank you to Marshi, John, and the Channel 5 team for putting on this uh, great event. Again, I think it's uh, fantastic to have resources like this for local game stores around the world to get information um, and hopefully things that can help them improve their business. But look, to answer that particular question, uh, I think that whatever formats the community uh, invents is is awesome. I think, you know, training card games, they are a, a community driven product um, and, you know, they're very, uh, and it, you know, they're a perfect medium for people to just play however they see fit and however they you know, like find fun. Um, I'm not personally aware of any that have become like really prominent, like a, you know, you know like a, 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 a EDH type thing yet. Uh, but we certainly keep our, you know, our finger on the pulse. And, and if there's something that really sort of picks up steam, um, would would we'll pay attention to that and look at how we could better support it. But at the time being, our focus is on Blitz, it's on Classic Constructed, it's on Sealed Deck, and it's on Booster Draft. And I can really attest to this working closely with LSS and James they really do have their finger on the pulse of things. They are always watching what this community is doing, what they want. Uh, and so I, I cannot encourage everyone that's part of the flesh and blood community, whether you're on the retail side or on the player side to give that feedback out. Because that one of the, one of the real, um, I think competitive advantages LSS has is your ability to kind of really, really take into account that feedback. So that's certainly been my experience. And I know from the discord and everything I'm seeing out there in the community, that is something that is very, uh, widespread experience wise. So um, another question, here, what are the best resources I can refer customers who are interested in learning how to play flesh and blood to? Mm. Well, my suggestion would be fabtcg.com welcome page. Um, so it's like literally the first click through on the top left corner of our website. It takes you to the learn to play video, to the, um, the, the simplified intro rules uh, and to some other click through resources to get started. Um, that would be the starting point. Um, and if you have the IRA welcome decks available in your store, like that is the best product to get someone started on their flesh and blood journey. Now that we have the uh, Monarch Blitz decks, these are also great products for your first play experience. But the IRA welcome deck has been designed specifically for uh, learning the game. And we have that learn to play video designed uh, to showcase that specific product. And we're going to keep making those IRA welcome decks available, um, you know, for for a long time going forward. Uh, I know that a, a new wave of them uh, hit the US stores. I think it was in March, um, and I believe that there's still some supply of those available. So if you don't have any at the moment, do reach out to PhD or Southern Hobby, um, and they should should be able to help you out with some IRA welcome decks. 
Awesome. So just, you know, it, it's funny because flesh and blood is still a relative newcomer to the CCG world, even though it's, it's kind of, it's kind of a linchpin right now. Um, what has been the most surprising thing to you about flesh and blood since its release? Uh, I mean, certainly the price of the cards on the secondary market is surprising. Um, look, I, I don't want to come off as being arrogant, but like when we designed this business, we, we designed it to be a global reaching business. And um, if you, for example, go onto our, our skirmish OP page, uh, which is the program which started this weekend, you'll see that there's 250 events for skirmish series running all across the world. It, it covers something like, you know, 20 plus countries. Um, and we're like, we always intended it for it to be a global reaching game with a, you know, a very, very large player base with a competitive OP circuit. Um, you know, these things take time. It's not like you just launch your product and you have this on day one, but we very much intended for this to be a big global trading card game. Um, and, you know, we're getting there. So I'm not surprised in that respect because that's what we've always aimed to achieve. Um, but again, I, I am surprised at how, how, like how the secondary market is priced in, um, you know, so, some of the high-end cards. And, you know, it's fantastic. We wanted the game to be collectible as well. I kind of expected that, that progression of secondary market value to maybe take a bit longer than it's taken. So it kind of in, in a similar vein, um, for those of us who are, used to playing different collectible card games there's this cadence that we have now with monarch where we have first edition and then like a month later we have unlimited um what are your thoughts and motivations and goals behind having that kind of a release cadence uh, well the reason that unlimited comes out so soon after first edition is just to support card availability like op is a massive driver behind what we do uh and people need cards to be able to go and play OP properly, and we don't want to see people priced out of the market uh, to just go and play in our official OP program. So that's that's the reasoning behind why Unlimited is coming out so soon after first edition. Um, you know, first edition is something very special. Um, I think that people kind of feel very proud to own the first edition cards, particularly the cold foils, particularly because most of those cards start the game in place. So it is definitely a bit of a you know a bit of a flex, a bit of a break. He writes. Look at my, you know, my cold foil armor set. Like, I think that's really cool. I like that. You know, a lot of people like that. Um, but we also just want people to be able to, like, go and make a deck for, you know, for a reasonable amount of money and just go and play in the tournaments and win tournaments with, you know, unlimited versions of the cards because they do exactly the same thing as the cold foil versions. So that's really the driver behind it. And we're monitoring it very closely, um, particularly around people's... Um, just feeling and reaction to, to barriers to entry to organized play because world post COVID organized play is going to be an enormous part of what we're doing. Um, so that, yeah, that, that's the driver behind it. And I, you know, I, I, I love this too, because I, I, there's other, there's other manufacturers, there's other producers in, in, in the collectible card game space that really want to intentionally ignore or omit the secondary market. And one of the things I think LSS has done, I don't think I know, I see it brilliantly is say, hey, we're going to support collectability. We're going to support playability. And I think that that is, that is such a gem here. You don't need to wait a year or six months to do that because the, the collectability is right there with first edition. You got the cold foils that set it apart. And then we have unlimited because people want to play. It's, a, it's, a, it's collectible, but it's a card game. We get that gaming aspect too. Um, Similar question here. Will big events like the calling wait until Unlimited has had a chance to circulate before being held? Um, so if you can, if you look at what we're doing with the current season of the calling, which is, um, you know, just it, it is an Asia Pacific thing at the moment um, because of COVID. But you'll see that the front end of the season is sealed deck. So we have the calling Auckland uh, two weeks from now. Um, that event's sold out actually at, at New Zealand's most prestigious venue. Uh, which we're, we're very, very uh, proud to achieve that. Um, but that's that's a first edition Monarch sealed deck tournament with day two first edition booster draft. Then the week later, we have the calling Melbourne, same thing. First edition sealed deck, day two, first edition booster draft. So like, we like this model because it gives people uh, an opportunity to get their hands on more first edition products. So that's a, like a cool upside. Um, and then it also avoids this, this thing of people not being able to get cards um, on the secondary market easily to build constructed decks. So you'll see constructed kick in about the, the same time that Unlimited is released. Um, and that, that's sort of the approach that we'll look at 
going forward and just until we get like a really good gauge on how the release structure of first edition unlimited secondary car market availability affects people actually participating in constructed formats. So this is, this is a bit of a, I'm, I, this is coming from Dylan and I, I'm not sure exactly. This is a very broad question. What are the plans for first edition going forward? Uh, and I'm not sure if that's just the idea of first edition sets uh, before unlimited sets or first edition Monarch, but um, it, you know, I think as we've already discussed, having that first edition is great for the collectability and for the collector market. So uh, it, what are the plans for first edition going forward? You can answer that however you want. It's pretty open-ended, James. I mean, it's, we've set the precedent of how it works. First edition comes out, it has cold foils, it has a set print run. Uh, it's what, comes out on release day and for pre-release weekend and when it's gone it's gone and then unlimited kicks in and that's what runs through until uh you know that eventually goes out of print so i mean that is the model and that's what we'll continue to do for the foreseeable future he was if, if, like it it works i was gonna say if it ain't broke don't fix it right <laughs> no, no reason to get in there um yeah I, I have a, so one of the other things I think is wonderful. Um, the first time I met James uh, on a call and you can see it right away is, is the passion for gaming and the passion for uh, flesh and blood, because you play this game, you design this game, you play this game. So here's a question. If you can answer it, I know, I know I, if you can't, you can't um, without going into details, you can go into specific details, but without going into details, is there a card or a card combo that you think is strong that players have haven't discovered yet? or have dismissed too quickly? Uh, there's probably heaps of them, to be honest, but um, yeah, I, I don't know. If people aren't all over the, the Bloodsheath, Skeleta, uh, Sonata, Arcanics combo yet, if they're not all over that, like Wildfire, like they need to they need to sit down and start playing with that combo. But I think that, I think that some people are over that one. I, don't, I think they're all over that one. Okay. Um, so from Michael Sohn asks, Wizards recently announced the sunset of organized play that pertains to players who seek to play professionally as a primary profession. With flesh and blood growing and organized in-store play returning slowly, what kind of OP trajectory do you foresee? Will there be an international tournament circuit with large prizes or will organized play be more focused on smaller stores? Now, I want to, I want to, you know, protect James here, but we just had the initial announcement. And so I know having worked behind the scenes on OP for, you know, different different manufacturers there's things you can talk about and things you can't talk about and that's just to say that's that's the way some of these things are so is there anything you can share uh, about that right now james yeah so as you alluded to in the intro marshy we just announced our op pathway um on friday new zealand time and uh look that's been one of the most viewed pieces of content on our website of all time uh, which is not surprising because it's a really big deal so to answer that particular question, it's pretty much yes to all of those things that you're asking. And we believe that it's very, very important to have a progression pathway for organized play so that there's fantastic opportunities that exist at the store level. And then you take one step up to that sort of regional level, another step up to the national level. And then obviously the, the pinnacle, the top of the mountain is the, 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 pro, the pro play. So pro tour, world championship. Um, you can go to our website, fabtcg.com. Uh, it's the, the, the number one uh, click through on the carousel. Um, and it goes into you know, a, an overview of uh, each levels of that progression pathway. Um, we are very much committed to supporting fantastic in-store play right from our weekly armory kits, um, which you know, the, 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 the shipping out across the world every single month um, with very, very attractive prize cards and play mats and all, all that good stuff. Um, the next step up from that is programs like Skirmish, which are also in store, but they're selective. So stores who are doing a great job building their communities and, and running events, they get selected for the Skirmish series. Uh, and as I mentioned previously, we have 250 Skirmish events running uh, on this season um, over the next, I think it's six weeks. Um, and then sort of the, the next step up from that is the Road to Nationals, which is also an in-store program, but it's a little bit more competitive than Armory or uh, Skirmish, which you can sort of see as, as the training grounds to, to step into that road to nationals. And I mean, as the name would suggest, it qualifies you for the national championship. Um, the national championship, we are looking to, to run in all countries that we support around the world. Um, typically, we would have timed that to be mid-year, um, like we did last year in the countries that could run it. This year, we are 
uh, targeting it for for nationals to be in Q4, uh, so that we can, you know, hopefully, COVID is under control in most parts of the world by then with vaccinations and so on, and we can get national champs running in as many countries as possible. Um, we're looking to announce the US national champs uh, venue and date um, pretty soon, maybe in, in, within the next couple of weeks even. Um, and it's gonna be a really, really big deal. And then, you know, the calling, which is you know, our big public event pro level play uh, with cash prizes and the, the premium prize cards, they will be rolling out ac all across the world from Q4 um, or, or sooner if things just uh, on the COVID front uh, just improve faster than we expect, but we do think Q4 is a, is a reasonable timing for that. We do have events um, across uh, June, July, and August planned at the moment for Auckland, Melbourne, and Taipei, um, but we are hoping to expand on that to North America, Europe, um, Singapore as well. Singapore was planned for July as well, but unfortunately COVID is, has, has surfaced again there and we had to cancel that event. Um, and then the Pro Tour will be coming with the World Championship in 2022. Um, and yeah, there will be the pinnacle of, 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 of the Flesh and Blood Organized Play uh, program. And we are absolutely committed to pro play. Um, but full details of that will be a little bit a little bit later in the year. The, the first information you can expect to see in detail is the road to nationals and national champs and callings outside the APEC region. And so for those of you who haven't had a chance to see this post, it's in chat right now. We threw the link in chat for the, uh, it's on fabtcg.com, the organized play post uh, that was up there. And it, it's been everywhere I've looked. I've seen it on every social media platform I'm on. I've seen people talking about it. So quite a hubbub over this OP post. The other thing, Michael, that I think is, is really important, drilling down to that last part of your question, will there be an international tournament circuit with large prizes or will OP be more focused on smaller stores? The answer is both. All of it, yeah. it, you heard James over and over say, we're doing this, but it starts at the store. We're doing this, but it starts at the store. So it really is, the answer is both, you know? Exactly. And I believe that you need both. Like the, the top the top tier of professional play can't exist without having thriving local communities. And you know, like, the, these are essentially the two pillars that Flesh and Blood is founded on. It's about having strong local communities. It's about people coming together in the Flesh and Blood at your local store. But we need aspiration and that aspiration, it starts in the local store and it, it just it moves its way up those, those tiers, um, which is visualized on that, in that post that Marshy just uh, linked to. And yeah, like it's always been the vision, like Fish and Blood has been designed with those, those design tenants of like reduced variance and so on to really support that highest level of competitive play. So you know, COVID has just sort of slowed things down, but there was always the intention and it's coming. Finally, we can do high-level pro play. So I've got a few, uh, there's a few questions here and look, flesh and blood is a very, very sought after product and it is hard to get through distributors. So um, these might be questions uh, that are more geared towards distributors than you, James, but let me, I'll go ahead and ask the first one here, which is, will there be some sort of metric at a point to allow us to get more first edition product um, I feel like that might be for distributors, but I, I, I'll, I'll put it in front of you, James. And if it's for distributors, it's for distributors. Um, yeah, sure. So the biggest area, or one of the biggest areas that we've been focusing on over the last six months is getting more volume of flesh and blood available all around the world. Every single market in the entire world doesn't have enough flesh and blood. Every single store in every single country is allocated first edition. It just, it is what it is. Um, and so we've been working very hard to, to try and solve this issue. Um, I, I can say that there will be more volume of flesh and blood available in the market from maybe mid June or, or mid July um, ar around that point. And when it comes to first edition product, yes, we are increasing volumes on first edition. It's not gonna be, <clears throat> it's not going to be just order however much you want. I'm pretty sure that first edition is probably going to be on allocation forever. Um, but unlimited product, I mean, the problem, well, in my opinion, the problem right now is you can't even get unlimited. Yes. Um, that's, the, that's the big issue. We need, we need unlimited to be something that you can just ring up your distributor and order because you need more stock and not to be put on a waiting list to get unlimited. That's the big issue right now. Um, but yes, coming back to the actual question, first edition will be somewhat more available, but expect to be on allocation probably forever for first edition. 
And yes, there will be some metrics coming in that will start to dictate how much first edition stores can get, such as the, uh, the, the OP activity in your store, if you're reporting events, if you're scheduling events in advance, um, mm -hmm. and, and things like that. Like there will be, it will be tethered somewhat to previous sales as well. Um, but largely, largely tied to the size of your community and your OP activity in your store. And we will be pushing through metrics like that to uh, support our distributors and how they allocate product for first edition. Awesome. And so um, you've, you've already covered some of this, but uh, Dream Days asks, uh, only one of the distributors that we use carries flesh and blood. And currently they only list three SKUs, all of which are designated out of stock. So we can't even put in a back order. What is the likelihood of you using more U.S. distributors? Look, more distributors doesn't solve this problem. There is just no exactly. fish and blood available, right? Uh, we're actually very, very happy with the, the work that our distributors have done. Um, and uh, sometimes I feel quite sorry for them, to be honest, because I see a lot of backlash about they're always out of stock, blah, blah, blah. Let's blame the distributor. Um, to be honest, it should be, you know, blame LSS because we, don't, we can't make enough product. Um, but believe me, we're trying to make more product. It's just the whole industry is doing very, very well. Magic's doing great. Pokemon's doing great. A lot of games are doing great. There's only so much, so many cards that can be printed in the world and we're printing as much as we can and we're working hard to get more volume and when more volume is available, the distributors will have that stock and flesh and blood will become more, more accessible. But um, I think in my suggestion would be just have good communication with your distributor. Uh, like, just talk to them if you need to get in a back order, but for whatever reason, their web portal isn't allowing you to get a back order and just do it manually. Get on, get your back orders on the waiting list and more stock is coming through mid year. Um, and we should be able to address you know, some of these issues or at least improve the situation. And this is not a, a, an LSS or flesh and blood unique situation. We're seeing this with, I mean, there was a worldwide pandemic. It, it shut down a lot of, uh, of printing uh, everywhere in the world. And so we're seeing this with every other game too. So it's not it's definitely not a flesh and blood LSS uh, unique situation. What may be a little bit more unique is kind of that incredible demand for the product. So maybe we're all feeling yeah. it as retailers more because that is what our customers are asking for. They are asking mm -hmm. us for flesh and blood. So you feel a little more acutely there, even though the other SKUs we're carrying are also shorted. Uh, it's just the banging on the door that, that we're, we're reacting to. Um, and one of the things I think that James said is so key, having worked with distributors for years and years and years at Superstars and, and Channel Fireball, you, you, you cannot be rough with them because the good times are coming and you don't want to be the one who is a jerk to your distributor when those allocations hit, right? You want to protect that relationship because you want, the, you, if everyone else is going to be a jerk, you want to be the one that was like, oh, that's right. You know, James was, James was really good to me. You know what? We'll, we will put a little bit of extra uh, flesh and blood in that allocation. So just it, it costs nothing yep. to be kind and it normally pays. Be incredible kind to distributor. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. Dylan asks, um, can you clarify what cards get replaced in the replacement program? What counts as damaged? I mean, we have the replacement program uh, clearly documented on our website. Uh, the, the expectation is that cards come out of the pack in near mint condition. And it's very important to understand that near mint does not mean pristine. Near mint does mean some edge wear, some nicks, some you know, surface you know, wear. Um, yeah. But anything which is sub near mint is uh, and is uh, doesn't include uh, commons does not include commons. Um, we will replace. Yep, and it, it is so important that you know, pack fresh and gem mint are just different. Near mint and yes. and gem mint pristine, it's just a different thing. And anyone who's been in the industry, whether you know uh, whether it's sports cards or whether it's collectible card games or just anything like that, you you know this. Come on, we're retailers. We know this. We we open product, and you know it doesn't come out kind of, kind of gem mint pristine. That's just physics. That's just how the world works. But having a replacement program like this is, is such a boon um, and, and a great great offering that a lot. Uh, I don't. I, I I think LSS, to my knowledge, at this point is the only. Um, manufacturer that's offering that. So it, it, it is a great boon to those of us who are opening a lot of product for singles and, and want to do that. Um, in terms of your vision for the future, we, we got, we got it. We got a peak of that James with organized play. Um, what else can you fill in gap wise? And I'll, I, I, 
I'll let you steer this wherever you want in terms of that vision for the future of flesh and blood, whether it's more set releases or a different cadence to the set releases or things like that. Like where else can, what else can you share with us here? And, and I, I'm putting you on the spot with a vision for the future statement. So let's just all be clear. We're not, we're not pinning James's ear back for, Hey, you said this at LGSC too, because this is just trying to get into your brain. And, and what, where do you see the future of flesh and blood right now? Yeah. So the, the, the obvious one is getting OP uh, running on a global scale. Like that, that's a big part of the future vision. Um, we want to uh, be supporting more local game stores all across the world. So at the, at the moment, um, you know, we, we may be something around 30% penetration, something like that, but we want to mm -hmm. like continue to grow that uh, and, and really be able to support all of the local game stores that, that, that carry training card games um, and to be able to do that really well. Um, we want to uh, take our fans on a fantastic journey of, of Wraith. So at the moment, uh, with the release of Monarch, it really that, that zeroed in and featured uh, Solana and the, and the Demonastery. Um, but we have six other just very deep, rich uh, regions of our world that we're going to be taking the fans on a journey on over the coming years um, and revealing you know, what the, uh, the unique talents are for each of these regions. So from a product experience perspective, there's a, a, a lot to look forward to. Um, we certainly want to uh, increase the uh, re release cycle to three um, new content releases per year. Um, so at, at the moment, obviously there was quite a big gap between Crucible of War and Monarch. Um, we have Monarch to Kingdoms, which uh, you know will, will drop around the, uh, September. But we kind of want to get onto that three releases per year cycle. It was always the uh, the, the vision. Um, so yeah, we're working our way towards that. Um, and yeah, just keep doing the best that we possibly can for all of the, the local game stores across the world. Keep uh, engaging and supporting the content creators around the world. And um, yeah, just getting back on planes and attending <laughs> big tournaments uh, in, in North America and Europe and yeah, really engaging with the, with the community. That's, that's what we're looking forward to. Wow. Okay. Well, speaking of getting on planes and attending tournaments, we have Trevor Baker, who uh, worked with us very closely at CFP events. Hey, Trevor, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, does LSS have plans to print flesh and blood in other non-English languages? Yes. Very good question. Uh, that is a 2022 um, project that we are looking at. And the answer is like a hundred percent. Yes, it is going to happen. Um, it's, we're aiming for it to be to, for this to start in 2022. Um, it that is something that we need to do to achieve one of the previous goals, which I said, which is to be supporting all the local game stores across the world. We just we just have to do it, and we want to do it, um, and to 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 acknowledge the the, the different needs of fans in different parts of the world. We, we've got to localize the product. So yes, it is coming. Um, we just got to make sure that as an organization that we set up to to be able to deliver and execute on that to the highest standard. Any, uh, any sneak peek at what languages are being targeted first? Um, look, we, we already have a very good presence in Europe and there's some parts of Europe that we can't service and support well at the moment because it's only available in English. So the starting point will be some number of European languages, but uh, eventually, you know, we'll be, we'll be pr printing flesh and blood in every language that is required to support every major market around the world. And uh, I, I know, I know, all of this is hypothetical right now. So I don't. Again, I don't want. I don't want us. I don't. I. I don't want us. Any of us watching and hanging out to hold James any of this. But does this mean at some point in 2022 or beyond we would be looking at foreign language first edition, like cold foils and foreign languages and things like that? Uh. I can't answer that at the moment, but we do have okay, very specific okay. plans for how we will manage first edition with this localization program. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but that's just exciting. You know, something something crazy like that is awesome. Yeah, um, we're very, very mindful of what that would mean for collectors. And we spent some, some amount of time debating and, and thinking about what would be appropriate in terms of uh, first edition and cold foils and collectability and having uh, potentially many, many variants of the same card in cold foil. And we, we, we do have 
we had some thoughts on it and yeah, we're not ready to announce anything about how we would do that. We may even reach out to uh, do a little bit more, a little bit more research on how, how, how the approach would be perceived, but we're very, very cognizant of the fact that this is, this is important to get right. I, you know, look for my money. I love the, some of the, the alternate versions of things like the twinning blade. I love that. I, that's probably one of my favorite looking cards, if not my favorite looking card uh, in, in the game is, is the, the alt art twinning blade. So, um, okay. Speaking to the longevity of the game and the fact that fab uh, flesh and blood uses a non-rotating format. How does LSS approach playtesting each expansion? Do you feel like you're approaching this process differently to your TCG predecessors? I mean, I, I don't know how our TCG predecessors approach this problem, to be yeah. honest. I've never been on any of the, the, the design or development teams. So, um, like, we've, we've found a, <clears throat> a method and an approach that works for us. Um, and, like, we, we've been expanding our development team as well. Um, we've got a fantastic team um, of developers in-house. Uh, one of the problems is I keep hiring one of the top players in New Zealand. So it's like we're, we're stripping out the talent pool from, <laughs> from, from New Zealand. But oh, there's a lot of great players in New Zealand. Um, but yeah, like we've got a very talented development team and I think that they're doing, uh, you know, a great job. Uh, obviously, as the car pool keeps growing and growing and growing, that, that you know, it will, it will be challenging to tick the box on every single possible deck and, and card interaction. But for the time being, I think that they've uh, got a good handle on it and we'll just uh, assess the best, the best way to uh, adapt and evolve our development uh, methodologies as we go forward. I think this is one of the things we see in, in other um, CCGs is the, you know, hiring top level players uh, or, or professional players in, into R&D and development. And where I think FAB has gone very, very well, uh, and, and some other games don't do this quite as well, is, is actually getting those top players. You, 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 don't, you, don't, you, you want some of the best players whose passion and understanding of the game has driven them to the very, very top. That, that's where you want to reach from because there's a lot of passion, effort, and understanding that goes into making it to become not just the best, but the best of the best. And so I think that, um, I think, I really think that that's the right direction for uh, game development because you're going to get those special insights um, from the very, very top of the heap. So that's, I, I love that direction for uh, flesh and blood. How, uh, you know, just, just, just coming from me, I'm here in the U S I'm here, I'm here in California. Uh, has live play just been pretty consistent in New Zealand during, during everything? Uh, yeah. I mean, we're very, very, very blessed in New Zealand. Uh, with, with, with COVID to basically have all of our liberties and our health here. Um, we've, um, I don't, we haven't had any communications for a very long time. So we, we are extremely lucky in New Zealand to be in that situation. Um, and it's similar in Australia as well, but uh, organized play in New Zealand is very strong. It is the number one trading card game in New Zealand by a very large margin. Um, if you go into any store on any weekend and you compare like Friday, Friday Night Magic to Flesh and Blood, we're about four to one. Um, it is just that strong in New Zealand. Um, so, like, I, I hope that I hope that we can replicate that around the world. We'll, we'll have to wait and see. But live players for Flesh and Blood is very, very popular in this part of the world. And for I, and I think this is super important for all of us out there, for all of uh, everyone here that's listening and, and 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 with us that are retailers with Play Space. The best example you can have of whether this game is going to get played and whether you should carry it and have live play in your store is the fact that there is, you know, two other countries where this is super robust, live play is happening, and people are playing this game. And they're playing this game, uh, in some cases, over playing other games. It's, we have this great little kind of microcosm of seeing what's already mm -hmm. happening with the gaming culture in New Zealand. Well, as things open up here in the U.S. and other parts uh, of the world, you, 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 you know, you can replicate it. You know, you can find it. That secret sauce is there for flesh and blood. So I encourage you guys to do it. It's, it's I know for, for us, because we don't have the game center open, but we have a pretty big warehouse. People are playing it all the time in the channel fireball warehouse. It's so from, from management on down, like everybody's playing it. So it's super popular there. Um, and it has muscled out some of the other games, um, particularly yep. uh, uh, um, board games. They used to be like kind of a more robust board game thing. And a lot of people are playing flesh and blood now. Yeah, um, I just on that topic, though, I think um, that 
people who play some of these other games are just playing them in different ways than maybe they used to. Like, you know, Flesh and Blood is really appealing to people who want organized play, like an organized play program with some structure, like the pathway that we've talked about previously today. Um, and I think that that the fans of these other games, in particular Magic, they're playing it in a much more social um, capacity these days. Like Commander is obviously enormous everywhere. It's, it's very, mm -hmm. very popular in New Zealand as well. And people aren't necessarily playing uh, Commander in the local game store, um, you know, in, in the same sort of, you know, time slots or, or maybe um, capacity that they would be playing like, a you know, organized play driven product like Flesh and Blood. So I, I think that the industry in, as a whole is just doing incredibly well. Like Magic is doing great. You know, Hasbro is just do, is so successful with what they're doing. Um, as you can see from the, the results that they're posting, um, you know, that they're doing a great job for their shareholders, just smashing all records. And the only reason that's happening is because a lot of people are buying Magic and loving Magic and Magic's doing great. Magic's just very different than what it used to be. And I think that, uh, and the same with Pokemon, right? Pokemon is just absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. But both of these products are providing something to consumers, which is very unique. And the same with Flesh and Blood, we're providing something which has become quite unique in the industry, uh, which is a, a, a very OP driven um, product offering. So I, I like that. I think that it's really good that consumers have options and they have choices um, and that there, there's lots of different experiences available to consumers uh, in our industry. Um, so, yeah, I just think that the, all the TCGs are offering something different. And I think that's great for the consumer. Absolutely. Um, and so you mentioned that you built the game with the idea that it would be sold all over the world. What made you know from early on that Flesh and Blood was going to be such a great success? Um, look, I come from a background of international business. Um, the the, the seven-year development of Flesh and Blood, it wasn't just about developing the game, it was about developing the business. Uh, I've been in this industry for a very long time, and, you know, there, there's literally been over 300 training card games that have come out, and, you know, all but three of them had died. Well, maybe four of them had died, like Magic, Pokemon, yeah. Yu-Gi-Oh!, and, like, Vanguard or whatever. And... Um, the thing that makes these games die is it doesn't matter how good the product is. It's the business is shit. Like the business just isn't, isn't, they don't have the business foundation to stand the test of time. And uh, look, my journey to get flesh and blood to market was, yeah, a hell of a lot of work went into actually developing the game, like seven years, well over 10,000 hours was put into actually developing the game. But, you know, probably even more time than that was put into developing the business. They could scale out to be a global reaching business. Um, so, that's why I believe that we, you know, could achieve this. You, you got to set yourself up for success. Um, and like, even if we fail, like if we, if we didn't set ourselves up for success, we were definitely going to fail. So like we did everything, we put everything in place for this business to be able to become a global business. And we gave ourselves the chance of succeeding and people like the game and retailers like the game. And now we are actually able to operate a global reaching business. And I think so, you know, he hearing that and uh, just because I've had I've had the pleasure uh, and the privilege of, of being in different phone calls and meetings with, um, with James and the LSS team, it's not this isn't just the business plan is there that that is super important. Um, and if you were if you were there, if you join us for LGSC one, you saw James talk about that progression, but it wasn't it's not just the business plan if you're familiar with this product it is the amount of detail and effort that doesn't just go into how the cards are made or what the artists but the storyline how everything in the game has such an incredible amount of context within the larger flesh and blood universe so, so i mean you know you can have a great business plan if you don't have a, a great product it's not going to take you too far likewise you have a great product but no business plan you're not going to go anywhere and that's where i think the attention to detail over that seven years that you, you, you and your team put into this is pretty unbelievable. Um, because for those of you who aren't familiar as familiar with the product, the story behind it, I mean, there is so much story. And I know we haven't even heard, we're, we're like the tip of the iceberg for, for uh, all the characters in the world, um, you know, Wraith and everything for flesh and blood. But trust me, I know because I've heard it and, and you can see it as these sets come out, how rich the product is beyond just the card game. It's not just how you play the game. It's not just, hey, is this card good? Is this card too OP? Where does this card fall? But every bit of the storyline, which I think is incredibly valuable. Um, and, and one of the things we see with older TCGs is how much 
their fan base go back to that storyline, right? We're seeing all these throwbacks in, in Magic and even in Pokemon. You see these other uh, IPs. They're relying on that now. And, you know, let's be honest, there's some shaky things in the early days because no one thought about that when they're developing it. But LSS, I think you guys did a wonderful job making sure, like, you know, in 10 or 20 years, when those callbacks start to happen, it's already filled out. Like, we've already, we already have that universe built for us. And I think that's one of the tremendous selling points for Flesh and Blood. Um, in in my you. mind, anyway. Yeah. Um, okay. So Michael Sohn, again, the uh, the card condition guarantee program described earlier sounds great. And I hope that it is and remains sustainable because the kind of service commitment is definitely unique. If cards are deemed problematic and are banned from OP, will there be anything done to address the probable cliff in the card's value? I don't want to convey an expectation because some games do, but mainly the online only ones without secondary markets. Yeah, that's something that's very easy to do online. Um <laughs> And much more difficult. And I think to date, it's only been drone that has been taken out of OP, right? Drone or brutality? Yeah, that's yeah, that is correct. Yep. So look, I oh. think um, the answer to that is just a pretty straight up no, uh, because you got to keep in mind that cards can get unbanned as well. So it doesn't make any sense to just like take all of that card out of circulation and then uh, meta games change and card pool changes and the card is fine and it gets unbanned and there's none left in existence, like. Um, it, look, it cards just have utility outside of official organized play formats as well. Um, there's nothing stopping people playing drone of brutality on the kitchen table. So Agreed. yeah, it's a hard no one on redemption for banned cards. I, I agree with you. Uh, I, I totally agree with you. And there's, there's a whole other reason that I like that line. You don't want that kind of financial issue hemming in the decisions you make for OP, right? Um, mm. And you, you guys have a tight, you, you guys have a tight R and D team uh, and things like that, but you know, you just don't, you don't want, why should that be a factor? Uh, and, mm. and mm. as you've already said, James, your kitchen table has whatever rules you want. And that's the beauty. That's the beauty of every game, right? You can ban yep. and unban anything you want on the kitchen table. Yep. So keep those cards and, and definitely have the ability to do that. Um, I do want to jump back to that last question um, because part of it was, when did you, when, when did you know, what was the moment where you could sit back and go, I it's we did it. We we did we're there. This is successful. We made it. Like was it was there a, a eureka moment for you or was there something in there that were like because you know you put so much into the game and of course even with the best plans and the best products sometimes things don't work out. So was there a moment for you James when you were like oh my gosh we got there with yeah, flesh there and blood. It was actually um and it was very recently it was uh the weekend of April the 30th and May the 1st. So we're talking about you know 3 weeks ago. It was the Monarch pre-release weekend, and I, honestly, I feel in the future, a few years from now, when people look back, they're going to look at that weekend as being a moment, a, a landmark moment for our industry when the tide started to shift. Um, and the reason I say that is we had 350 pre-release events running around the world, and th this was by invitation only. It wasn't, stores just couldn't mm -hmm. run a pre-release event because they mm -hmm. wanted to. It was by invitation only. So 100% of the stores that were offered pre-releases as far as I'm aware, ran a pre-release and over 95% of those events sold out. They sold That's crazy. out like weeks before the event ran. And the, the amount of, of stories and messages and social media posts that, that I saw and was told about of people driving four, five, six hours to go to a pre-release, that... That was big for me. Like I remember back when I was, you know, a teenager, and like I didn't hesitate about like driving six hours to go to the pre-release because it was like something that was just like really <laughs> special and it was worth going to. And yeah. it's like you just wouldn't miss it. And I feel like that hasn't existed for quite some time. So to see that amount of just like drive and passion, I like, gotta be there, and they can't miss this. And stores just being maxed out, and seeing the photos of like just the joy and excitement and happiness on the on the faces of people all around the world. Um, there was the moment that I was like, yeah, we've done it. I, I love that story. There, there is a way, you know, as, as, as we get older in whatever we're pursuing. Uh, and of course we're all retailers here. We're working in the game industry, but that moment when you can kind of think to yourself, um, which is the vibe I'm kind of getting from you, you know, you know, teenage James or teenage Mosh, you'd be so inspired and happy by this, by this, by this very thing. And that is such a personal success. So I'm really, yep. really, I'm happy for you that you got that. Cause that is really something when you can say, Hey, guess what? If you got in that time machine, you could just pop it and say, 
Hey, just FYI, we did it. Okay, now I got to go back. <laughs> you know, it's, you, you get that. That's awesome. Um, so thank you to all the people who drove four, five, or six hours to go to the pro race. I, I, I will be eternally grateful. Thank you very much. <laughs> We've all been there. The number of pre-releases and PTQs or whatever that I've piled into a, a car and driven four or five hours to is, is higher than uh, I'd like to admit. So um, ooh, this is a very good question. Over that seven years planning this game in business, what was one of the biggest unexpected lessons you had to learn about bringing a collectible card game to market? Uh, look, life is just every single day is like full of unexpected challenges and lessons. To be honest, like if you uh, you, you gotta you gotta be learning something all of the time. So uh, I wouldn't say that there's one one like big one that just like slammed us, but I mean there, there's like literally a thousand like little lessons that you have to learn to to get across the line. It's it's really hard. Like it's really 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 hard. Yeah, it is. It, it, and you know, anytime you take uh, your passion and your hobby and start to turn it into a business, you start to learn how much more there is to it, right? Uh, even even when you've educated yourself and and you have planned out just before making that jump, you make that jump and you just learn a million little things that you couldn't see. Uh, and yep. that you're right, that's life. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Well, James, any final thoughts? We've taken up uh, a bunch of your Saturday, uh, and th- or I guess is it Sunday? Yeah, Sunday here. It's Sunday. My bad. It's of course we've taken up a bunch of your Sunday. So before letting you go uh, to enjoy the rest of your weekend, any final thoughts here for us? Um, just thank you to all the retailers around the world who are supporting Flesh and Blood, and um, look, we'll keep working as hard as we can to to help your businesses to be successful and. Um, I just thank people for their, their, their patience in regards to product availability issues. And I, I can assure you that this is a, a, an issue which is uh, close to being, maybe not solved, but certainly um, improved greatly. Um, we, we have some great products coming through, through the pipeline. We've got uh, Crucible of War Unlimited coming uh, yeah. mid-July. That particular product, I will, we'll just be upfront about it. It is coming to market over three waves. And uh, unfortunately, the first wave is much, much smaller than we would have liked. Um, but we do believe that it's important just to get that, that small first wave into the market um, sh- as soon as possible because the road to national season will be running um, at that time as well. So just like doing something to address card availability around some key singles like the spoils for war and so on um it's better than doing nothing but um brace yourself for a little bit of frustration around not being able to get as much crucible of war as you would like on that first wave but it is coming to market over three waves um across the space of about six or eight weeks mm-hmm. um and then in september we have kingdoms um hitting hitting stores their product is it is a, a great product it's very different than monarch um, Monarch was something very significant for, for, for flesh and blood, um, introducing the talents, you know, it introduced a lot of like very, very new and flashy stuff to the game. Kingdoms just sort of stabilizes a bit more. It just consolidates on some of those wins that we've got. Um, but the one thing that kingdoms has, um, that is different than every other product is myself and pretty much unanimous within the entire development team, Kingdoms is the best limited format flesh and blood product by quite a considerable margin. Um, so nice. we're gonna have the callings uh, running off the back of the release of, of Kingdoms with the, the seal deck uh, cut to, to day two draft. There's gonna be national champs, which is gonna have Kingdoms draft. Um, and like I, I've, I've had so much fun and the development team have had so much fun uh, drafting this product in particular. Um, I like I, I feel that Kingdoms is one of those products that you just don't mind having a box of it sitting on your shelf and like in 2026 you like grab it off the shelf and get some mates over and do a draft uh, and it's kind of like you know a, a board game in a box kind of experience if you like it's just one of those products that you'll just be really really happy to draft for like years into the future that's really the key selling point of Kingdoms is just it is the best special blood limited format product to date and for Constructed it just sort of just um 
consolidate on some of those pillars that have been been established without adding anything like too flashy in terms of like additional constructed um, sort of like like angles or, or dimensions. Um, but it, it is good for constructed, and it, it brings in some some other uh, or new some new heroes and some class types that people want to see uh, a bit more support uh, for. Um, and so basically, look, a lot to look forward to. Great products coming. OP is going to 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 kick off, and um, look, we've we've spent a lot of time just making sure that we can execute on what we want to do to a very high standard. Like at the end of the day, we just want to do a great job for all of the fans and all of the stores and we want your businesses to be successful and to do our very best to provide uh, not only the product, but the marketing materials and the programs and the clear communication um, to, to be able to assist you in, in supporting those local in-store communities. If I had to sum up uh, the, the, this Q&A, there's a few things that I think really stand out um, to me as a retailer and as someone in this industry. One, look, James has been across it this whole time. There are supply issues with the game. And what I love about this talk we've had an opportunity uh, to have here, James, is one, you're very transparent. You talk about the crucible, hey, three waves. That's just transparent. So everybody knows. Let's just get it out there. And that kind of transparency from a manufacturer, we, we don't get a lot of that a lot of times. So that, that is amazing as a retailer. Number two is... Look, James and his team, they hear it. We're, we're, they, they've gotten tons of this feedback about the supply. And I mean, you've acknowledged it over and over. Um, and so I, I started off early on saying, look, the LSS team, they are, they are listening. They are hearing it. They, they watch, they react. They, they will act on that feedback. And that's very, very evident in everything you've said here. And then finally, this most important thing here is the way you talked about <laughs> that kingdom box up in the corner that you can pull down. You know, I, I said I said you were a gamer and that you were part of R&D, but that was uh, such a gamer mentality for how we're what we're going to do with this product, right? You're going to rip a bunch of product, maybe for constructed, get some, you know, for uh, for for you know playing at the kitchen table drafts, and then you're like, well, this this format's really really good. Maybe I need to save a bit of this for later days. And I love Seriously. that. That's the it's the perfect way uh, to 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 put an exclamation point on uh, this LGSC. So thank you to. James White from Legend Story Studios for joining us and sharing some of his great knowledge. And uh, we got a bit of roadmap stuff about, about the future there at the end with um, Crucible Unlimited, with Kingdom. So thank you for all that. For those of you, anyone who's listening who hasn't gotten into flesh and blood, one, do it. Diversification is super duper important. Mm -hmm. Two, if you're not on Binder POS and you want to check out Binder POS, I just want to say if you book a demo, your first demo um, with Tyler, we'll post the link in the chat. If you book that demo, you do that demo, um, we, our gift to you from Channel Fire, but we will send you a free box of Monarch Unlimited to check it out. That is something you want. You want to get into flesh and blood. If you are a retailer and you aren't into, and you, and you have other CCGs in your store, you need to be in flesh and blood. It is by far, it is, there's such a high demand product. We get emails, social media, everybody's asking us about flesh and blood and you start carrying the product, they're going to start asking you about flesh and blood. So I implore you, you know, diversify and diversify into flesh and blood. If you haven't checked out Binder POS, please check that out. And we will, we will ship you gratis on us, a box of Monarch Unlimited. It's coming out. Incredible. Shortly, so yeah. So thank you so much, James. Thanks for giving up time on your Sunday and sharing all this information with us. As always, it is an absolute pleasure to spend time talking with you. And uh, that does it for us here at uh, LGSC2. We will have a second uh, second. This was LGS 2 C2, Mosh. We'll, we will have a third one. The, the announcement on that will be coming pretty shortly. Uh, and if we're lucky, we will get James again because um, he's been pretty consistently joining us for all of these and is always a delight. So that does it for us this weekend. Thank you to everyone who's given up time on their weekend to join us, to ask questions, to engage with us. Uh, and until next time, as always, please, please, please be wonderful to yourselves. Be wonderful to each other. Take care, everyone. We'll see you soon.